Good morning. Welcome this morning into the house of the Lord, and uh, thank you for bringing your bright and cheery faces to worship this morning, and uh, that makes up for the rain and the cold outside, so I'm glad to be able to join together this morning and to worship the Lord and to seek his face as uh, we continue to work through Jeremiah uh, and Jeremiah's life. A couple things I want to remind you about or tell you about uh, this morning. So next weekend is Time Change Weekend. Can you believe it? Already. Time next weekend is the first Sunday in uh, November and it's clocks go back and stuff like that. And I know that that is hard sometimes when you lose that hour's sleep to get motivated to get up early on Sunday morning and be able to come and, and stuff like that because you just, you really miss that hour. So what I tell you to do is sleep a little bit extra next week, skip breakfast, and then come here for 10 o'clock and have breakfast here. And that way you'll save a little bit of time at home, but you'll also still get to eat and you'll get the fellowship. So next Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, we're going to be serving breakfast out in the Welcome Center. Um, and, uh, and so we want to encourage you to, to come for that next Sunday uh, as well. Um, this Sunday, after church, after worship, I'm going to invite the men to uh, stay and, uh, and join the men's choir. We're having a men's choir, Faithful Men for Remembrance Sunday. And, uh, and so if you would like to be a part of that, they're going to, they're going to practice for a few moments after worship this morning. Uh, Remembrance Sunday is actually Remembrance Day, November the 11th. So the service is not in the morning that day. It's going to actually be in the afternoon at 3 o'clock. And that way you can still go to the Cenotaph service. But then you can come here, and we're going to have a very special uh, Sunday. We've got some special guests coming. We've got some special stories being shared. And uh, then we're going to have supper afterwards. There's a potluck supper afterwards. So you can see those details in your bulletin. Next Saturday, there's a craft sale going on downstairs, and the uh, uh, tables or some of the proceeds from that is actually going towards our Philippines team, so uh, take note of that. And we also have a congregational meeting coming up on the 14th, and the details about that are in the bulletin, and just uh, read through that. I mentioned last Sunday, it's uh, really about a bit of a crisis we're going to have very shortly, and so you can take care of that. And the last thing I wanted to mention is the One Ton Challenge is coming up. This is something we do every fall to benefit the food bank. And uh, we collect food at grocery stores from people who want to donate it to us, and then we take it to the food bank. We usually get around $15,000 worth of food in just a matter of six hours or so. And uh, this is our 10th anniversary of doing it. And so if you're interested in doing that, you can see the sign up. Uh, you can see the details in the bulletin, and you can sign up using your connection card. So, on the back of your connection card, you'll see an opportunity to write your name on the front, and then on the back, just check off what times you would be available, and then you'll get a, a schedule uh, a few days before the actual event. I think those are all the things I want to share. Again, welcome. It's so good to see you this morning. I invite you to stand as we worship God through song. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 103, verse 1. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. G. You give and take away for my good, but who am I to say?
bless the Lord this morning, our God, our great God, the only God, the one and only God. He's not a God that we created, but he created us.
Lord our God, great God, only God, God of the universe, God of my life, God of our lives. God, we bless you this morning. Come into this place in power as we praise your name because there is power in praise. Make our hearts joyful. Make our hearts uh, thankful and praiseful as we come here this morning. May we see you. May we see only the good around us. And may we confront the evil. For in this place, you are God alone. In our hearts, you are God alone. In this world, you are the only true God. Come by your spirit, we pray. Draw us close to you in power and in your might, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you're seated, I invite you to greet those who are worshiping nearby. Good morning. The scripture this morning is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 10. You will find it on page 1152 in the Pew Bible. For those of you who would like to follow along, it will also be on the screen. And this is where uh, Paul gives instructions to Timothy. Now, Paul spelled out some very basic instructions to Timothy on how God's people are to live, no matter what their circumstances. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, <coughs> excuse me, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith, and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance and for this we labor and strive, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, and especially of those who believe. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word.
Thank you, choir. That's uh, it's one of my favorite of the old hymns, that last verse as it uh, says, praise the Father, praise the Son. It just feels like your tongue is rolling in a, in a melody to praise the Lord and uh, such a blessing. So thank you for sharing that with us this morning. And uh, as we continue to praise the Lord, as we continue to worship Him, we bring to Him our tithes, our offerings, our gifts. And so as we do that, let us dedicate them to the Lord and let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that we can indeed come into your presence and praise you, and indeed that all of creation uh, has been created for your praise, for your glory, that we might indeed express our love and our fellowship with you. We ask, Lord, this morning as we present these gifts, these tithes, these offerings uh, as an expression of our love and as our fellowship, that you would use them to bless others, that you would use them to do your work. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
I invite you to stand and join in the singing of the hymn, I Know Whom I Have Believed, hymn number 409 in your hymn book, or the words will be on the screen. And as we sing, you can stand, and as we sing this hymn, I invite uh, the children to come up to the front for a moment with the pastor before they go downstairs to their program. Good morning. You guys see me every week, but you know, I'm not the only one who works here. There's lots of us who work here. And uh, so I actually have invited, or I haven't actually invited, she has invited herself, Christina, to come on up. And she has a few words that she wants to share with all of us this morning. Christina is actually the chair of our board here at the church. And so I'm going to give her the microphone. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I'm going to ask some of the big kids of our church to come up this morning, in addition to the little kids. Um, so Pastor Peter, if I could have Pastor Marilyn as well, and um, Pastor Scott Dunham as well, and we'll have Julie Probert, and Irma Hawks back there, and Dale Sproul, and Jim Monteith. And Robin Randall, if you'd like to all come up. So these are a lot of the people who make our church run and who um, keep us all in check and help us with our ministries and our events at the church. And we just like to take this time to acknowledge and thank you for the work you do and the hours that you put in. And may God continue to bless you as you help us with our ministries, and just continue to give you strength as you help our church. And we'd like to give them a round of applause. Thank you again. I'll hand the mic back. <laughs> Good. And I know these are, these are the folks that we have on our staff, but everyone really is a minister in the church because everyone has a part in the role that we play, okay? Let's pray, and then I'll let you go downstairs. Father God, we thank you this day for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for those that you call to places of service. We thank you that you call each of us to serve you somewhere. And we pray, Lord, that as these kids go and are served and ministered to by some of their staff, that you would bless them and those who are working with them. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Good. All right. You can follow your teachers out. morning. Um, so today Julie and I chose a song by Michael Card. It's called Talitha Kumi. 
And Talitha Kumi comes from a very specific story, and that's sort of the song tells the story. So it's the story of the little girl that Jesus raised from the dead, and it's told in each of the Gospels, but in the Gospel of Mark exclusively, uh, he uses these words, and I have it here at um, Mark chapter 5, verse 40. It says, after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. So this song tells that story from the little girl's perspective. Our father was frightened as he looked down at me, and though my eyes were closed, still I could see the confusion and fear he felt to hide with a smile as he wondered if he might lose his one and only child, Talitha Kumi. He spoke like a song, though lifeless and cold at once, I became strong. Talitha Kumi, he spoke with a smile. As he handed my father back his only child And so all at once he left and desperately ran To find the compassionate one with the healing hands When he finally found him Jesus said, do not fear. And Father found peace in simply knowing that he was near. Healing hands were touching my brow. I made the long journey back. Still, I don't know. was the first I saw, the first words that I heard, the warmth of his healing hands, the sound of his healing words, Talitha Kumi, spoken soft in my ear, though I was so far away, Somehow I could hear Though death had made me deaf I heard with my heart And followed those healing words And walked away from the dark Talitha Kumi He spoke like a song Lifeless and cold at once, I became strong. Talitha Kumi, he spoke with a smile as he handed my father back his only child.
Evan, are you here? Oh, there he is up there. I'm going to pray. Let us bow our heads before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we give you thanks this day for the good news that there is life in you. That Jesus not only died, but he has been raised from the dead. That he has the power to raise each of us, dead in souls, uh, away from you to new life in you. We thank you this day, Father, that this new life is ours here and now when we accept you. And that it is ours for eternity. So, Lord, as we come to you on this day, we remember and pray for those who uh, may be experiencing the burdens of this world in this time. We pray, Father, for those who grieve this day and loss of loved ones. And uh, pray, Lord, that you would be close to bring peace and bring comfort and strength. Pray for those who are in the midst of sickness and illness and hospitals. And we pray, Lord, that you would be uh, gracious to them. Think uh, especially of Faye and of Heather and uh, the hospital here in uh, Fredericton. And just uh, pray your hand upon them. We pray too, Father, for those who serve you. Uh, and we thank you for each one who is a part of the work and the ministry of grace. Uh, we think too also of our partners uh, around the world. We think of those who serve you within our uh, Atlantic churches. We think especially of uh, Peter Reed the executive minister, and ask, Lord, that you would bless him and give him wisdom as he leads us uh, as a group of churches in this part of the world. I think, too, Father, of uh, uh, Terry uh, Smith as he leads uh, Canadian Baptist Ministries. We think, too, of our partners in mission, the Waddells in the Philippines. And, you know, it's been a hard week for uh, some of them as, uh, as they experienced uh, theft and loss, but we also know that you are gracious. And so we pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless them and the work there, Lord. And especially for our team here at Grace as they prepare to go and be with them next April. And two of Patty, uh, our partner in Bolivia, and pray, Lord, as she leads teams, as she encourages people, that you would just use her in very special ways to build uh, greater discipleship for you. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together and worship you this morning, hear your word. And we ask, Lord, that as we hear your word in a few moments, that you would just uh, apply it to our hearts and to our lives. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Here we go, a short video I want to show you. When I think of the CBAC. When I think of the CBAC. 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 When I think of the CBAC, I think of mission. I think of community. I think of family and friends. It's very, very inspiring. Makes me want to do much, much more for the churches. I think of my extended church family with all of those crazy uncles at the family reunion. When we think of the CBAC. When I think of CBAC. When I think of CBAC. When I think of CBAC, I think of friendship. We think of family. Our missional gathering in our community. A sense of belonging and family. I think of a lot of inspiration and a lot of hope for the future of the church in the Atlantic Canada. Being a part of God's family. When I think of CBAC. When I think of CBAC. What do I think about CBAC? I think of a group of Christians that have the diversity in leadership of both men and women, and I very much appreciate that. A supportive family. I think of the memories made at Spring Forth. So what do I say? When I think of the CBC. Oh, right. I think of. When I think of the CABC. When I think of the CABC. When I think of the CABC, I think of family. Oh, shit. One second. <laughs> Friendships made at Total Impact. Fellow pilgrims on a journey. I think of loving people the way God loves them. I think of men and women serving together in ministry. When we think of the CBAC, we think of hashtag one, one neighborhood. neighborhood. I think of a great caring church family. Opportunities to serve, like this past summer at Title Impact. The family of churches that I've been a part of all my lifetime. I went overseas and was supported by churches from all across this area. I've been in many, many of the churches, big and small, on deputation. So I am very, 
warm feelings for this Fellowship of Baptist Churches. I'm greatly blessed to be a part of CBAC. It's really fun. So CBAC, today is uh, CBAC Sunday. It stands for, not what it says in your bulletin, but it stands for Canadian Baptists of Atlantic Canada. We've changed our name a few times. Sometimes it's hard to keep up. But basically, Grace is part of the York Association of Churches. The York Association consists of about 25 churches in the Fredericton area. The York Association belongs to the Canadian Baptists of Atlantic Canada. That's 450 churches in... New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, and Newfoundland, and Newfoundland and Labrador, because we actually have one in Labrador as well. Uh, CBAC is actually part of Canadian Baptist Ministries, which is four of these conventions across uh, Canada, and Canadian Baptist Ministries is part of the Baptist World Alliance, uh, which is churches around the world. So you think this morning, it was just a, a few of us gathered here in this little building, but we're actually part of a large community, a large family of churches that extends around the world. And in particular, Canadian Baptists of Atlanta and Canada work to help uh, empower our local churches to do work and ministry. Some of the things that you might be familiar with that they do is we meet every year at a place called Oasis, which is where we do business, but it's also where we get encouraged and refreshed along the way. Title Impact, which is actually coming next summer to the Fredericton area, largest youth mission event in Canada uh, every two years. Spring Forth, the largest youth uh, event, or largest youth uh, Christian youth event uh, in Canada that happens every year in Moncton and so forth. We also have been planting churches. We want to plant 65 new churches in Atlantic Canada before 2025, so we're in less than 10 years and so forth. Um, and the neighborhood group, the neighborhood group that we're meeting Tuesday nights, that's the material that's been provided by our convention uh, of churches that are working here in Atlantic Canada. And so, uh, oh, and by the way, that guy in the middle that couldn't get the name right, that's actually our president this year for Canadian Baptist, so on and so forth. Uh, so we have a president who's elected and it changes every year, uh, but we also have an executive uh executive minister, and his name is Peter Reed, and so here's just a 90-second clip of a message for him, from him to us. I have great news. We have moved into our new offices at Crandall University and have completed the sale of our building in St. John. We are thrilled to celebrate CBAC Sunday together with the 458 churches that make up our family in Atlantic Canada. I especially want to thank you for your support and for your partnership in this ministry that we do together. Your prayers, your volunteers, and your engagement in the ministries that we do together are crucial to the success of the CBAC. We really are stronger together. Whether it is Acadia Divinity College, Crandall University, a title impact, Canadian Baptist Ministries, our pastor's pension and benefits, new congregations and church planting, the One Conference, clergy formation and wellness, congregational renewal, or even leadership development. Everything we do is meant to support and enhance the ministry of the local church. We are so thankful for your prayers, for your ministry volunteers, for your financial support of the CBAC. May the Lord bless you in these exciting days. Well, we've been working on Sunday mornings through the book of Jeremiah this fall as uh, we talk about what it means or how can we have confidence in the midst, midst of chaos. Uh, and so forth. And we've been looking not so much at the writings, but at the life of Jeremiah and how he did his ministry and so forth. So this morning we're in chapter 35, and this is about halfway through his work and his ministry and so forth. So Jeremiah chapter 35, verses 1 to 16. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord during the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. Go to the Rechabite family, 
and invite them to come to one of the side rooms of the house of the Lord and give them wine to drink. So I went to Jazaniah, son of Jeremiah, son of Habizaniah, and the brothers and all his sons and the whole family of the Rechabites. I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the room of the sons of Hanan, son of Igdala, the man of God. It was next to the room of the officials, which was over that of Masaiah, of son of Shalom, the doorkeeper. Then I set bowls full of wine and some cups before the men of the Rechabite family and said to them, drink some wine. They replied, we do not drink wine because our forefather, Jananadab, said, uh, son of Rechab, gave us this command, neither you nor your descendants must ever drink wine. Also, you must never build houses, sow seed, or plant vineyards. You must never have any of these things, but you must always live in tents. Then you will live a long time in the land where you are nomads. We have obeyed everything our forefather Jehonadab, son of Rechab, commanded us. Neither we, nor our wives, nor our sons and daughters have ever drunk wine, or built houses to live in, or had vineyards or fields or crops. We have lived in tents. We have fully obeyed everything our forefather, Jonadab, commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded this land, we said, come, we must go to Jerusalem to escape the Babylonian and the Armenian armies. And so we have remained in Jerusalem. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Go and tell the men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem, will you not learn a lesson and obey my words, declares the Lord. Jonadab, son of Rechab, ordered his sons not to drink wine, and this command has kept. To this day, they do not drink wine because they obey their forefather's command. But I have spoken to you again and again, and yet you have not obeyed me. Again and again, I sent all my servants, the prophets, to you. They said, each of you must turn from your wicked ways and reform your actions. Do not follow other gods to serve them. Then you will live in the land I have given you and your fathers. But you have not paid attention or listened to me. The descendants of Jonadab, son of Rechab, have carried out the command of their forefather gave them. But these people have not obeyed me. I, uh, I attended a lecture earlier this week at St. Thomas University. I think I, I, I think, I can't remember exactly, but I think I saw uh, it advertised or mentioned on a Facebook post somewhere, and it just intrigued me. The, the lecture was called The Enacted Narrative, a group-based trauma repair for veterans who have post-traumatic stress injury. And you might hear that, and you might think, well, that sounds boring. But two things kind of intrigued me. One is, I have a number of friends who are military chaplains, and I have other friends who are in the military, and I know they deal with some of these issues. And I thought, it might be interesting to see how all these things are addressed and how they're doing, and just to learn a little bit more maybe of what some of my col colleagues go through. The second reason I was interested was because of the title, The Enacted Narrative. Narrative. Narrative is just a fancy word for story. And story, well, story is about half of what I do here on Sunday mornings. It's what I'm doing right now, is telling you a story. And I thought, maybe this might help me be a better storyteller to discover a new way to tell stories and so forth. And the second thing I, I guess I learned then at this, so I learned two things at this conference. I learned actually more than two, but two that I may mention. One is, they don't call it PTSD anymore. They call it operational stress injury. And secondly, that there's a center, a center called the Center for, just let me see if I can find it here, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Narrative. They got a center, a whole group of scholars whose job is simply to research stories. I just thought that's amazing. I can see you're thoroughly amazed as well. <laughs> I know my daughter's impressed because that's what she did her degree in. So. 
Anyways, the lecture that evening was done by Marvin Westwood, who 20 years ago founded something he called the Veterans Transition Network. It helps veterans who are suffering from operational stress injuries to overcome what we would normally call PTSD. And they do it through three retreats. On the first retreat, they gather together about eight veterans and about four other staff who are former military people or uh, military people who have probably gone through the program. And on that first four days, they just share their stories. They tell who they are. They share their autobiographies, mostly their childhood and when they listed and all those kinds of things. And the purpose of that is simply to build trust, to build rapport among the group. The, the last retreat this is two days, and during that, they take everything they've learned from those other two retreats and they figure out how they're going to then go forward in their lives, how they're going to, after having recovered or in the process of recovery, uh, make changes going forward. But the middle one, the second one, is four days when they tell the story of their injury, how they came to experience this moment of operational stress. But they don't tell the story. Most of them are guys. Guys don't like to talk about these things that are all emotional and feeling stuff like that. So what they do is they enact the story. Instead of just telling the story, instead of just sitting around in a circle and telling each other the story, they actually stand up, get a few props, and act out the moment of that stressful situation. Uh, and relive it with other people in the group being other people in the midst of that story and, and so forth. And it's a powerful moment as the participants begin to see, almost from the outside, but begin to understand themselves. There's a powerful thing about not just hearing, but seeing and being a part of the story. And he showed actually a few videos of the experience. One was a, a, of a young man who had to, who watched one of his friends die in a car that was bombed and on fire and he couldn't rescue him and so forth. And it's just reliving that moment and then being able to take those moments, get through them so that he can actually relate better with his family because these things impact your whole life. There's something about reliving a story that really impacts you. Now, Jesus knew this. Jesus knew that. Every time we gather together on the first Sunday of the month and we celebrate communion, we are not just telling the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, we're enacting it. We're reliving it. The bread and the cup, visible reminders of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah knew this as well. He knew the power of a story, not just told, not just saying, let me tell you about, but of people seeing what was happening and beginning to oppress upon them the story. And this happened in Jeremiah chapter 25 with the Rechabites. Strange little community. The Rechabites actually traced the route back to the Kenites who in the time of, who lived in the time of Abraham, and they kind of, well, kept going. They are a nomadic tribe, that is to say, they didn't live in any one place, they traveled around. They lived in tents, and they went from place to place to place. And their work was metalwork, so they went wherever the next jobs were going to be. They worked in copper, they worked in iron, they made swords, they built chariots, they made pots and pans, they, anything that was made out of metal, they did the work. When the Kenites came to town, you went out to them and you got them to do your work. Well, a couple hundred years after uh, the first Kenites, actually one of the most famous Kenites was a guy by the name of Jethro, and you might remember Jethro was the guy who was the father of Moses' wife, so Moses' father-in-law. And the Kenites in those days then began to travel with the Israelites because they were now related by marriage anyway. Well, a couple hundred years after Moses, there's a Kenite whose name is Rachab. And he, is, uh, he has a son by the name of Jonadab. Uh, and this is during the time of Ahab in the northern kingdom. So this is after David, after Solomon. 
This is after the divided kingdom, and this is Ahab. Ahab, you might remember, was married to Jezebel, and they were like the worst kings ever, uh, worst king and queen ever. Jezebel was the one who brought all the Canaanite gods, Baal in particular, into uh, Israel, into the northern kingdom. And so after a few years of this, they have that showdown with Elijah and uh, the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, and they begin to be eliminated. Well, after that, we have the story of Jehu. Jehu was anointed by Elisha to be the next king to take over from Ahab's family. And Jehu, as he is coming to eliminate the idolatry, as he is coming to eliminate Ahab's family, especially Jezebel, runs into Jonadab. And Jonadab, he stops and he says to Jonadab, are you with me or are you against me? Jonadab says, I am with you, because Jonadab was fed up with what was going on. Jonadab was fed up with the idolatry, with the drunkenness, with the oppression. Everything is associated with it. He hated Baal worship and that it was taking over the people of God. And so when he, Jehu comes, he says, I am with you. And he is there when Ahab's family is executed and taken out. Jonadab then decides, we need to do something about this in our family so it never happens again. So he comes up with three rules for his family. Three rules. The first rule is no house. They would always live in tents. Because Baal was the god of Canaan. And when the Israelites moved into the land of Canaan, they thought, well, this is the god here, and so we'll worship this god instead of sticking with their own god. He says, so we're not going to settle down in this land and make us remember or make us think that Baal is our God because he's the God of this land. We worship Yahweh. We worship the true God, the God who is God of everything and everywhere and is not of any fixed place. And so his family, his tribe, never had houses. Secondly, no farms, no vineyards, no olive orchards, no wheat fields. Farms and fields also tie you to the land. And Baal was the god of fertility. He was the god of the crops. He was the god of the rains. And we are going to have nothing to do with that. We are going to work with our metal and our copper. And we will trade for whatever food we need. But we are not going to compromise our faith by having ties to the land of pagan gods. No farms. And thirdly, no wine. Drunkenness was probably one of the most offensive things about Baal worship. You had to be blind drunk almost to be part of some of the things that took place. And besides that, drunk people usually reveal secrets. And metal workers, well, they needed to keep their trade secrets. Otherwise, they'd be out of business. Everybody could do it. And so they would drink no wine at all, not even a little. They would be distinct and separate from the rest of the nation. They would be dedicated to God as a family, and they would be distinct from their culture. No houses, no farms, no wine. And everybody knows this. When people saw the Rechabites come into town, everybody knows. There's that weird group of people who won't live in houses, who won't plant crops, and who never drink wine. Everybody else wants a big house. Everybody else wants to have lots of land. Everybody else likes a little drink. What's the matter with those guys? Well, 250 years after Jonabab, we have the Rakavites. He named his tribe after his dad. Not a nice little thing. But they're living in Jerusalem. Well, why are they living in Jerusalem? Aren't they supposed to be living in tents? Well, we blame the Babylonians. In 601... The Babylonians have conquered Judah, and they have made Jehoiakim their vassal. And then they go on, they try to conquer Egypt, and it doesn't work. The Egyptians beat them, and they have to run back home to survive, or to get their army built up again. And the king, Jehoiakim of Judah, thinks, hey, the Egyptians beat them. Maybe I don't have to follow them after all. And he starts to rebel against his Babylonian, um, his Babylonian conquerors. And they haven't got enough armies to come back and to take care of him. So instead, they said the Arameans and the Chaldeans, their allies, other people they've conquered. And they say, go take care of those guys. So the Arameans and the Chaldeans, they come down. They can't get into Jerusalem, but they start to raid 
all the little villages around Judah. So they go in and they burn villages and they steal crops and they make as much trouble as they could. And if you're living out in the land in a tent and all these little armies are coming every now and then to make these little raids and attacks, a tent isn't a lot of protection. So the Rechabites figure if we're going to live, we're going to survive, we need to move into the walls of Jerusalem. And they become refugees. They're fleeing persecution. They're fleeing war. Which brings us to Jeremiah 35, which we read earlier. Oh, no, it took a long time to get here. But Jeremiah chapter 35, the Lord says to Jeremiah, I think you should go and get the Rechabites and have them in for lunch. Invite them to dinner. And invite them to the best place. Invite them to the most popular place in town. Invite them to the temple. Reserve a room at the temple. Invite them for dinner. And don't forget to serve them the wine. Make sure you offer them wine. But the Rechabites don't drink wine. Jeremiah reserves the Hanan room in the temple. It's right off the main courtyard. He prepares a beautiful meal. It's a very public place. This is the room off the main temple official's space. Had a great view, was easily seen by everybody who walked through the temple. It was a very public spot. Everyone would have been able to see Jeremiah's having company today. Jeremiah sets the table. The whole tribe comes. He's put the forks on the left and the knives on the right. He put the wine cup right up on top of the knife. Puts these big pitchers of wine in the middle of the table. All kinds of them. Lots of wine. The best wine. The most expensive wine. And the Rechabites arrive. The whole tribe. The free dinner with a famous prophet. Best room in the temple. Who wouldn't come? Their numbers and their reputation probably draw the, the eyes of everyone who goes. Look, why are all the Rechabites in the temple? What are they doing? People are staring at them, looking to see what's going to happen. And as they sit at the table, Jeremiah stands up and he says, Let me propose a toast. Let us drink to your good health. Bottoms up. I can imagine Jeremiah spoke as loud as he could, that everybody would have heard exactly what he said, that this generous and gracious Jeremiah was offering wine to his esteemed guests. Jewish hospitality. So what are they going to do? I don't know how you were raised, but when I was growing up, I was always taught, you should always be a gracious guest. When you're invited to someone's house for dinner, you always eat what's put in front of you. That it's rude to do otherwise. Liver and onions? Somehow, get it down. Brussels sprouts? Lots of butter and grin and bear it. Boiled cabbage? Eat it. But whatever you do, do not embarrass your house by telling them how awful the food is. So the Rechabites are in front of this crowd, curious onlookers. They have been offered by their generous and gracious host a little wine. What are they going to do? Just one drink? It would be rude not to, and only polite, only respectful to take a drink. It would be embarrassing to their host if they refused. But Rechabites... They don't drink wine. Maybe they looked around the table for a moment at each other, a little quiet. Have some wine, Jeremiah said it again. And they spoke up. We do not drink wine. Our ancestor commanded us to never drink wine. Not us, nor our children, nor our wives. Jonadab commanded us to never build houses, to never own a farm, to always live in tents, and to never drink wine. And we have never broken that command. The only reason we're in town now, they said, is because the Babylonian puppets are going to kill us. And it doesn't matter what anyone else does. We will never, ever drink wine. And they didn't. They never drank the wine. Next thing we read, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, 
the God of Israel, go to the people of Judah and say this, can you not learn a lesson? Can you not learn a lesson from these people? And it becomes clear why God had Jeremiah offer this drink in the midst of the temple in front of everybody. It's to teach a lesson. It was to be an enacted story. It was to be an object lesson for all of Jerusalem. And Jeremiah had one primary lesson to impart to everyone who was in the temple that day. But I want to suggest this morning there are three things that we can learn from the Rechabite community. Three things that we can learn about them. The first lesson is simply the power of obedience. The power of obedience. Jeremiah stands up and he says, can't you learn a lesson from the Rechabites? They have been faithful and they have obeyed they have obeyed the commands of Jonadab for more than 250 years. They have never drunk wine. They have honored and obeyed their father's command to this very day. And yet God, your heavenly father, has commanded you on how you to live in a relationship with him. How to love God and how to love others. He has set you apart for a life with him and a life of love. He keeps giving you a second and a third and a fourth chance. And you rebel again and again and again. You think it's too hard. You think mere humans could never do this. Well, the Rechabites, Jeremiah is saying, they're humans. Mere humans like the rest of us. And they've been living a life of obedience for 250 years. There is power in a life that is lived in obedience to God. Notice what Jeremiah is not saying. He's not saying you have to obey the Rechabite rules. He doesn't say everybody has to sell their house, live in tents, never plant another crop, and only drink water. He did not tell the people you have to follow the Rechabite rules. He said, obey God. Obey the commands of your heavenly father as diligently as the Rechabites obey the commands of their earthly father. Jeremiah challenged them. Every one of you can live this life. Every one of you can live as God has called us to live. You just learn to live in obedience. Instead of living like the culture around you, instead of living like the Canaanites, live like the people of God. Instead of idolatry and the evil pursuits, worship the Lord and Him only. Live well in the land of the Lord. The problem is not that you can't do it. The problem is that you won't do it. That to you it seems easier just to live like everybody else around you. Especially when the pressure is on. I got an email this week from my pension company. Part of the work of the CBAC, by the way. The question was simply, will you have enough to, re to live on when you retire? And I thought, um, well, isn't that what I got you for? How am I supposed to know that? That's your job. So they got me to answer a few questions. And it turns out, after I answer these questions, no, I don't. <laughs> Thousands of dollars short. So obviously, what I have to do next, now don't tell anybody else, I'm going to have to embezzle some funds from my employer, stash it away. Invested in lottery tickets so that I can win a million dollars so I'll be able to retire. <laughs> Isn't that what it's like? When the pressure is on, when the challenges come, we want to break the rules so we can get what we want, what we think we need. Do we find it easier to just go along with society than to live obediently to what God has called us to do? You know the Lord's commands. You know what the word says, but when push comes to shove, is it easier to give in like the rest of our world or to stand out as people who follow God? That was the main message of Jeremiah in this moment. These people, these people that you see right before you, they always have obeyed what their fathers told them. Why can we not obey what the Lord has told us? Beyond the power of obedience, however, to change our lives, there is also the power of their spiritual discipline. Spiritual discipline. The Rechabites were 
an example of great diffident, a discipline. They had strong, confident character in the face of the chaos of their day, but also in front of challenges. The Rechabites chose to live in tents and to give up houses, to give up land, to give up wine, so that they could be faithful, not just to Jonadab, their ancestor, but faithful to the principles of God. They took on the discipline of a nomadic life so that they would never forget that God was not a little local deity. He was the God who created the universe. They gave up alcohol because in their culture, alcohol was intrinsically tied to the Baal worship. And they wanted to make sure that nobody ever confused their worship with the worship of this false god. Paul wrote to Timothy a few hundred years later. He said essentially the same thing that Jeremiah said. He said to Timothy, people are abandoning their faith because they're following deceiving spirits, because they're following the will of this world. But then he says, don't waste your time in useless chatter. Instead, train yourself to be godly. How do you train yourself to be godly? The Rechabites took on practices in lifestyle that allowed them to always remember that they worship God. For the Christian, there are certain disciplines. There are certain spiritual habits which can help us never lose sight of the fact that we belong to God. Most are pretty commonly known. We have to just be disciplined enough to do this. And we know this to be true. We know that if we walk regularly, we'll have greater stamina in our life. We know that if we lift weights regular, regularly, we'll grow stronger muscles. We had our first snowfall the other day, and I remember listening to the news, and I think there was about a half dozen accidents in this area on that day because of the weather, because people get out of the habit of driving in winter's conditions, and it takes a while to learn them again when the first snow comes. So we need disciplines so that we know how to live when the first snow comes, when the trials come. There's power for life in regular prayer. There's power for life in scripture reading. There's power for life in regular attendance at worship and in tithing. There is something within our spirit that is strengthened when we spend time fasting, whether it's fasting from food or fasting from our electronics, our technology, so that we can devote some more time to the Lord. There's power in spending time in solitude so that we can sit alone with the Lord. There's something within us that strengthens when we humble ourselves in the serving of others. And these spiritual disciplines are not miracles that make us something super spiritual, but they're ways that we build our spiritual muscles so that we can get stronger when we face the chaos. So there is power in the spiritual discipline. Finally, the Rechabites' lesson teaches us that there is power in community. See, they not only obeyed their ancestor for 250 years, they stayed together as a community, as a family, as a people who believed in the Lord for those years. Regardless of what other challenges we might face, they might have faced, there was a community of believers who worked to maintain their faith. They had a shared heritage, they had a strong sense of identity, they had a strong sense of family. And all of those things, I think, made it easier that when the wine was put in front of them, they could just stand up and say, no, we are a community. We are a people. We say no to this. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, we should never give up meeting together. We should never give up meeting with a community of believers, but we should encourage one another in our walk. We should motivate each other to do the right thing. That there is power and strength in being a part of a regular community that gathers together. A place where we can share our faith and our trust in the Lord together. A place where we can be accountable for what we do and how we live. There is power when you are part of that community to help you do well. And each of us should be part of encouraging that community. And be an encouraging part of that community. 
and surround ourselves with those of like faith so that when the challenges come, we can say, we stand with the Lord. The lessons of the Rockabite communities were clear for Jeremiah. That there is power in obedience. There is power in developing spiritual habits to maintain your life. And that there is power in being part of a community. Some of you may have heard this past week, pastor, author, Christian thinker Eugene Peterson passed away. He's probably most famous as a guy who created the message, translation of the scriptures. He's the founding of a Presbyterian church in New Maryland. Grew up Pentecostal, started a Presbyterian church. For 29 years he was the pastor there. More recently he lived in Montana. He authored 30 books. One of the most well-known being the lo a long obedience in the same direction. It's a look at the at the Psalms of Ascent, the songs that people would sing as they were going up to Jerusalem. And I remember reading that book very early in my ministry and being struck by his insight in his writings. And after that, I just wanted to pick up anything that he written, anything that had his name on it. He died last Monday morning at the age of 85 after his long obedience in the same direction. If you know who Bono is, he's one of my other favorite guys in this world, sitting across the table from them. When Bono read uh, Peterson's book, Bono said, I need to meet this guy. And Peterson said, sure, I'll meet him. Who is he? Who is Bono? Who is you too? <laughs> Philip Yancey said that when Princess Diana died in 1997, he didn't know who she was either. That he was much more struck by the other woman who died that week, Mother Teresa. I mention those things to put this quote in context. He was a man who stood confidence and confident in the midst of the chaos of his life, in the midst of the chaos of American culture. Maybe not as chaotic then as it is now, but he spent his last week in a hospice. But he said, his son said, sorry, his days were joyful in the hospice. And his final words, spoken to an unseen guest, we're let's go. So about Jeremiah, and this particular story in Jeremiah, Peterson wrote that it's easy to give into our culture. It's easy to live a mediocre life that looks just like the rest of society, and a little bit of your soul will wither and die when you do. But every time we choose to reject the crowd's habits, practice the disciplines of faith, the obedience, the spiritual habits of being part of the community. And a little bit more of us becomes alive, becomes alive in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this day for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your desire to draw close to us. And we ask, Lord, your forgiveness for when we have given in too easily to the work of this world, to the norms of this world and not look to you. We ask, Lord, this day that you would strengthen each of our hearts, that we might live in obedience to you, that we might indeed do the things that would help us never forget our ties to you, that you would help us never to neglect a tie to your community. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. a quick reminder of next Sunday, um, come for 10. Have breakfast with us. Enjoy fellowshipping with that community of faith uh, as well. We're going to close this morning with number 395, Teach Me Thy Way, O Lord. Number 395. Words will be up on the screen, but uh, they're also in your hymn book at 395. Let's stand together as we sing.
As you go forth on your journey into the world this week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.